Hello, I'm Hannah Donnett with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Change is bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnerships, calls, webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's CHE EDC Strategies Partnership Webinar, which is titled Non-Toxic, Guide to Living Healthy in a Chemical World. Our moderator today is Jerry Heindel, founder and director of Commonweal's Healthy Environment and Endocrine Disruptor Strategies, HEAT. We will leave time following the presentation and interview for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature available on the top of your menu bar at any point during the presentation. After the presentation, our moderator will read out questions for our speakers to respond to. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period, and we'll follow up on unanswered questions for the, after the webinar. For those of you who called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 45 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Jerry. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone to our webinar highlighting the new book, Non-Toxic, Guide to Living in a Chemical World. This book was written by Ailey Cohn and Fred Bomsal, and it's actually the second book, as you can see from looking at the slide here, that the two of them have written. So a little background on each of them. Ailey Cohn is a board certified rheumatologist and integrative medicine specialist and founder of the Integrative Rheumatology Associates. In 2015, she created the smarthuman.com to share environmental and prevention information with the public. She lectures nationally on environmental health topics for elementary schools, high schools, colleges, university, medical schools, and even physician training programs. In 2016, she was awarded the Burton Eichler Award for Humanitarianism. Fred Bomsal is Curator's Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Biology at the University of Missouri. He is a world-renowned expert and leader in the endocrine disruptor field. Indeed, he was one of the founding fathers of the field. His research focuses on low-dose effects of BPA. For his outstanding contributions to science and the environment, he was honored with the Heinz Award, which comes with an unrestricted cash award of $100,000. This new book we're going to discuss today is an outstanding contribution by two experts in the field each coming to the topic from a different angle, a clinical angle and a basic science perspective. It does a great job of helping us all understand the effects of endocrine disrupting chemicals on our health and how to protect ourselves from these exposures. It's the most comprehensive, detailed, but easy to understand discussion of this topic. Not only does it discuss all the chemicals and their effects, but also how to reduce your exposures and includes your own non-toxic household uh, guide to make products so that uh, you can clean your house non-toxic manner. And it even helps you with healthy recipes. So this book really then has it all. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to ask both Ailey and Fred some questions and they will respond. And if you have questions, put them in the Q&A and we'll ask those at the end. So the first question is a three-part question. Why did you write this book? What niche does it fill? And what audience was it intended to, to be written for? Okay, I'll field that question. Thank you, Jerry, and thanks for having us. Um, so as you can see, we wrote a book together, a textbook with 26 contributing authors in 2017, which was pretty much got geared towards uh, those in an academic setting, 
with science background. Um, this book was designed purposely for the general public to reach uh, sixth grade education and below, um, to not be socioeconomically limiting in its recommendations. Um, people do not need a science background per se to understand the concepts, the recommendations, the tips. Um, and it really is the first of its kind that we're aware of um, when we research this type of guidebook, which we fought very hard to make sure people knew it was a guidebook. Uh, it's for people anywhere on their journey, um, and this is a journey from beginners to experts, and it's a resource that we hope people will refer to again and again. Terrific, thank you. So why is it that some chemicals found everywhere and are actually useful chemicals for their specific purpose, have these toxic properties that lead to disease. So could we have the next slide? So what this slide shows is an example of a class of endocrine disrupting chemicals that have the ability to hijack the actions of thyroid hormone and which is a hormone that operates through a complicated series of enzymatic changes and binding to uh, transporter molecules. And these uh, uh, flame retardants, brominated flame retardants and chlorinated flame retardants, the PCBs and the PVDEs, can bind to thyroid hormone receptors but they don't do all the things that thyroid hormone does. And the consequence of this is that you end up with abnormal brain development when this exposure particularly occurs during brain development, fetal and neonatal period. And uh, it's just an example. And there are many other examples of environmental estrogens and antiandrogens that uh, hijack various parts of the endocrine system. And they do this at very low doses. And one of the biggest changes due to endocrine disruption research is a focus on very low dose exposure instead of very high acutely toxic doses. Okay. Are there specific times across the lifespan that people are extra sensitive to these effects of these chemicals? Yes. Um, so I just mentioned that fetal development is a time that disruption of thyroid hormone critically leads to brain damage and lower IQ and uh, general cognitive ability is disrupted uh, as well as social behavior and all kinds of problems. But uh, basically, uh, an endocrine disruption field has focused on periods of hormonal change. And during fetal life, the hormonal systems are developing. And uh, that's a period of high vulnerability. And then the neonatal period is also a lot of growth of organs in the brain is occurring. And then again at puberty, uh, during the pubertal period and early adolescence, there's a, a, a potential for disruption and also uh, a pregnant woman. And then finally, that something's received not enough attention is the transitions from adulthood to aging period, old age, uh, and particularly menopause in women. And these are periods of high vulnerability to endocrine disruption. Okay. So in your book, you, you mentioned that we live in a chemical world. What do you mean by a chemical world? Uh, the next slide gives you some indication of uh, the household products that uh, are going to contain various kinds of endocrine disruptors. And these are covered in substantial detail in our book, Non-Toxic. And um, again, if you think of vulnerable periods, you know, you think of plastic toys that are going to be made from polyvinyl chloride and leaching uh, diethyl uh, 
excuse me, uh, diethylhexyl phthalate, a phthalate and BPA. Food containers also uh, leach these chemicals. There's lots, uh, we'll cover drinking water and food. And then uh, things like air fresheners that contain phthalates as fragrance carriers. Uh, these are uh, not good for you. So there's lots uh, of, there are lots of products in your home that uh, you have to be very careful about. And this just shows a collage of uh, pesticides, uh, things like a wine bottle that is likely to have BPA in it due to the containers that the wine is held in before it bottled, uh, pills that uh, often have phthalates in the pills, the lining of cans, which is made from BPA, food packaging, uh, which is a problem I'll talk a little bit more about. So um, again, it's just all of these products have potential problems with them. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> you also yeah. highlight that chemicals that can cause harm, as you just mentioned actually, are everywhere. Can you give some examples of more specific chemicals than just this picture that you're just showing there? Yes, so in the book, uh, we uh, have a lot more detail about what is going on in your home and uh, the flame retardants and nonstick, uh, uh, or excuse me, the um, anti-grease uh, things that would be applied to furniture, for instance. Uh, there are many different sources of endocrine disruption in the home. Uh, and uh, I don't want to go through all of them here, but uh, this is an indication that uh, they're really uh, quite a problem. Okay. Something else I noticed in, in your book and that you say, we are what we eat. Where does that come from? Okay, if you look at the next slide, um, parents can uh, associate with this. Here's a uh, really pretty horrible example of a breakfast cereal eaten by children uh, that have coloring in them, food coloring, food preservatives, uh, all kinds of additives, uh, flavorings, and uh, none of these chemicals are being tested. And so there's thousands of chemicals in our food that uh, we know nothing about. Uh, and you can show the next slide. Um, you know, we've got a Food and Drug Administration and it has a drug division that tests for the safety and efficacy of drugs prior to their use. The Food Division of the Food and Drug Administration uh, does not do this. They take exactly the opposite approach and next, uh, they allow industry to claim that products that are not tested uh, are declared generally regarded as safe. And the rule that they work by is that you have to prove through human disease that they aren't safe. And this applies to literally thousands of chemicals in our food. Could I have the next slide? And this is a cartoon that basically says, you know, oh yes, we test for plastics. And it's kind of a long-term test because it's an uncontrolled experiment to see what eventually happens to people who are exposed to these chemicals. There is no pre-market testing. And this is just really unacceptable. Next. So it's, that sounds like one of the things you're saying is that 
this whole area of processed food is bad for us. Is, is that true? Yes, the, uh, so could I have the next slide? Proce oh, never mind. I'm sorry, you can go back. Um, th the major problem that we face is that processed foods like this the box of Fruit Loops um, have so many chemicals in them that have never been tested and never identified to the public. There's no way that you or I can go and find out what these chemicals are. And so uh, this is a particular problem with processed foods that are also loaded with salt and sugar uh, and uh, are nutritionally really terrible for you in many cases. And Ailey will get into that in more detail. Okay, so what about the drinking water? Is that a source of uh, toxic chemicals? Yes, so that would be the next slide. And just as an example, we're finding out that there are a lot of chemicals that are not being tested in your drinking water. For instance, the perfluorinated compounds, PFOA, PFOS, these are compounds that DuPont and 3M have just lost multi-hundred million dollar, billion dollar, excuse me, suits over. We all know about the flint lead exposure and other heavy metals that are not adequately tested. And incidentally, there are supposed safe levels declared by the EPA for lead, but the scientific and medical communities are unanimous that there's no safe level of lead. And there are things like perchlorate, which is present in rocket fuel and explosives and is ubiquitous in water that's drunk in the United States. And it's particularly terrible around military bases where people in our military are being contaminated terribly by this chemical. So there, I don't wanna go through all of the things here, but it, here's an example of industry providing pollutants, uh, concentrated animal, uh, 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 operations, CAFOs, that uh, there is massive excretion of waste that gets into drinking water, agricultural runoff into our drinking water. And so uh, it's a huge problem. And uh, Ailey will get into remediation uh, things in your home that you really need to do as this comes into your home, it's really up to you to clean the water using water purification systems because it's not clean coming into your home. Okay. So from the knowledge you gained from writing this book, can you come up with a list of the top 10 or 12 endocrine disrupting chemicals and where they come from and diseases that they cause? So this will be, I think, Ailey, go ahead and... Uh, oh, sure. So, yeah, I mean, if you had to pick out of 90,000 chemicals that are currently available in our world uh, in the U.S., uh, these are a top 10, you know, list um, of some of the most well-studied uh, internationally um, and supported by the World Health Organization, the American Academy of Pediatrics, Endocrine Society as um, endocrine disrupting chemicals, where they come from, um, and well, I should say the previous slides is where they come from, but really what are their health effects um, as we know so far, and, and there's more to be disclosed, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, these are some of the ones that we talk about in the book, Non-Toxic, and we also try to give people very, very um, productive, uh, practical, cost-effective recommendations for how to lower those exposures from all of the stuff that we love. And so um, we want people to know the full story from the problem all the way to the solution. Terrific, so let's, let's move on then to how to reduce the exposures. 
Yeah, and so just to tie in how endocrine disruption uh, chemicals can, these chemicals can link, are linked to inflammation. And we have plenty of studies to show their increase in a lot of what our immune system was designed to do, which was to get angry when it gets exposed to things it doesn't recognize. So we see that there's elevation of, of, of inflammatory markers um, like IL-6, TNF-alpha, um, IL-17, uh, leading to the um, development of many chronic health conditions such as diabetes, heart, heart disease, autoimmune disease, a lot of these on this list, um, and also in effect can lead to increased response to COVID-19. Um, and we now know that the more comorbidities that one has, the more likely their risk of having an inflammatory, an exaggerated inflammatory response to COVID exposure. Anyone can get infected, but it's those that have more co uh, comorbidities on board, uh, which basically makes them more likely to have inflammatory um, uh, markers elevated, the more likely they can have um, uh, a worsened course. Um, and what we're tying together is really how chemicals affect inflammation, inflammation affects um, comorbidity risk. Um, and really that, that leads to the problem in stage three, as we can see. Um, and so there is no better time than now, in fact, because of this horrendous pandemic to really start thinking about reducing exposures because in fact it reduces, um, you know, in terms of our, our immu immune system and our endocrine system, it puts things back in order as best we can. Um, top 12 recommended, it was 10, now it's 12, it could be 30, but we wanted to keep the slide reasonable. But essentially where we know these exposures come from, such as canned food, such as BPA, which lines every canned food and drink in this country, Country, very, very, very small proportion are not lined with BPA. Um, we want to think about nonstick pans and getting rid of the PFAS chemicals, those perfluoralkyls um, in a variety of our industrial uh, products. Um, think about plastics in terms of storage and in heating. We want to avoid that um, and change to glass stainless steel. A healthy water system is one of my top, my personal uh, beefs is because I think because of body mass index, that's one we should really concentrate on, especially if you're pregnant, especially if you have young children by body mass index. So creating a healthy water system, we have an entire chapter dedicated to drinking water and how to get clean drinking water and which are the filters and what to think about. Um, so it's very easy for people to pick up and understand. Dusting, uh, cleaning is very important due to the chemicals in those, in dust in homes. Um, and not to go through every one of these because I want to get to some more suggestions, but also thinking about our air quality, thinking about personal care products, not just what we put on our skin, but uh, feminine care products and thinking about those chemicals and that route of entry into the body. Um, understanding how sleep, diet, exercise, stress management, all play into inflammation in terms of how they lower some of the key components of the immune system um, is really a mechanism by which we can protect, all of us can protect ourselves in some way from these chemicals and also help to reduce those chemicals. What we eat matters and we're gonna go into that. Exercise floods the liver, it helps with liver conjugation for detoxing and breaking down chemicals. Sleep is key to removing chemicals around the brain through the glymphatic system. Um, and of course, stress management changes the pH of our gut so that we can have the gut microbiome in better order uh, to help protect our immune system because that's a key component of human health is managing the gut microbiome. Um, Medications, we have a whole chapter on medications being chemicals too. Uh, so people can understand not, not to get off of medications necessarily, just to understand how they work and what to ask doctors in terms of whether they should still be on them and what the outcomes. So it's just a matter of being armed with the right questions and information on medications. Um, and of course we have a whole chapter on EMF radiation. So we can all use our technology toys, our tech toys uh, safely, especially with children. Um, and that can be done. Um, and also the use of appropriate supplements that do help, help us get nutrient sufficient, which we're gonna go into a little bit, but supplements, because we can't get it from diet entirely in the amounts and in the quality we need, we have to consider supplements as well that are helpful for the immune system and endocrine system. Next. Okay, thank you. So would you go into a little more about vitamins and supplements and things that you can do you know, sometimes you can't get rid of an exposure. So if you are exposed, is there something that you can do to reduce the toxicity of those chemicals? 
Yes, and that's why this, this slide is so important. Um, there's a, tons of data, I mean, remarkable amounts of information that really shows that when we're nutrient sufficient, we have what our bodies really need, what our anthropologic template of our DNA, what we've been used to eating and drinking for millions of years, when we are nutrient sufficient, we are in fact better as human beings equipped to handle these toxic exposures. Um, next slide. Um, number one, cruciferous vegetables. We spent some time talking about how they contain in a variety of nutrients such as sulforaphane um, and uh, you know, other very important flavonoids and um, you know, sulfur containing vegetables that really do help detox the gut, uh, I should say in the liver and um, lead to increased glutathione. Um, so cruciferous vegetables are a winner when it comes to what you can do from a dietary standpoint to help reduce um, harmful effects from many exposures and to reduce the burden. Next. Um, these are just some of the antioxidants, minerals, and vitamins that have interesting data, animal and human studies, showing their effects on the immune system to bolster it. We now know with vitamin D3, a lot of press on this with COVID. Um, vitamin D is really quite important for immune system uh, 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 effects. We also know folic acid or B9 actually helps reduce um, DNA methylation uh, that occurs with BPA exposure and some other harmful chemicals. Same with quercetin. We know that reducing, uh, that being exposed to PCBs um, from fish or from industrial chemicals, polychloral, uh, poly, help me out, polychlorinated biphenyls, methylmercury, um, the quercetin, which is just an antioxidant from apples and onions, can help reduce those levels. Uh, being children who are sufficient in iron and vitamin C help reduce lead exposure um, harm. Um, selenium is a quite an important uh, micronutrient uh, or mineral, I should say, that's got neuroprotective effects. Um, and so these are things that we need to think about in terms of just the human fertilizer, as I call it, with patients to help uh, the human body help itself with all of these exposures. Iodine particularly, I want to make mention, that's very protective against perchlorate, cyothionate, and some other environmental, common environmental exposures that actually sit in the thyroid where iodine should be sitting to protect it uh, and protect it from endocrine disruption uh, chemicals that, that can have effects. So again, not too much of any of this, but sufficiency of nutrients is quite key. Terrific. So if you look over the, the entire book, are there just uh, a few take home messages that you'd like to leave with the, the audience? Yeah, I think that we're living in a world where we have to be honest, these chemicals aren't necessarily going away. And at this rate with the lack of, you know, US regulatory laws uh, and the failures that we're really in it on our own to some degree in terms of human health, we need to really arm ourselves with good information Chemicals are ubiquitous. They're everywhere, 90,000. Um, they, there's very minimal oversight. And Tosca and some of the other laws have not served us well. And then chemicals really can get absorbed through many roots of the body. People think of just maybe air quality or skin, but we also, again, have the vaginal mucosa for feminine care products. The placenta does not act as a wonderful barrier to many of these chemicals. So we really want to get uh, you know, educate young people who are one day going to be pregnant, perhaps pregnant women, uh, young, you know, parents of young children. Um, long-term health, ex uh, health issues, uh, I should say long-term exposure can cause health issues to many of these chemicals, but particularly during, as uh, Dr. Vamsal said, during these critical periods of human development when endocrine uh, change is going on. Um, Radiation has its risk. We have a chapter on it to show people what the problems are, but also really simple ways to manage exposure in your home um, that don't take a lot of energy or effort or cost. Um, noise pollution, stress, all of these things we need to think of as, as environmental exposures that can be worked on. And really just being aware of what goes on in and around your body is a great way to start to reduce those exposures is awareness. We actually put together the best of what we could find for vetted resources, lists, vetted um, apps, websites. Uh, you know, we did our best to make sure we had evergreen information that people could refer to over and over again on the internet. Um, but we also gave our own opinions and, and, and specifics. So um, I really encourage people to take a look um, at this book if they're interested in starting this journey wherever you are on it. And you mentioned other resources, and I know you actually have a list of some other resources that 
people could use, right? Yeah, this is a wonderful list. Um, we use a lot of uh, science from many of these organizations. They also have, as I mentioned, ongoing information on uh, even radiation, like Environmental Health Trust is a wonderful group. Um, we have information from Green Science Policy Institute, which does a lot of work with PFAS chemicals and how to look up couches that may have no, you know, uh, no flame retardant chemicals or brands. Um, Environmental Health News is an ongoing source of great information. Um, so we wanted people to have the vetted resources, nothing that's you know, clouded in conspiracy or, you know, backhand deals, just really legitimate nonprofits that are well vetted for their information. Okay, so Ailey, I have a specific question just for you because you're a clinician and, and I'm wondering why is it that we have such a hard time getting clinicians in general interested in, in environmental chemicals and and looking at environmental chemicals as a cause of disease and dysfunctions they see in the clinic? It's a great question. I will tell you, having lectured to a lot of different medical bodies, there is not so much, I would say there's interest, but because the system is set up where we do not learn nutrition or anything from an environmental health perspective in medical school, even now, uh, I haven't been in med school in 25, 30 years, and even then we didn't get it, but apparently now there's not even but five hours of nutrition offered in training as a medical doctor, um, even as we speak. So I think that it's more of the system as an issue, plus we have, you know, as a clinician uh, in, a, in a typical practice, you have 15 minutes with a patient, which is very limited in, in terms of what you can share with the patient. And you need to be well-trained to be, I mean, not so much well-trained, but you need to have um, good information. My goal, my hope, um, and I think Fred's is as well, is to really educate doctors, healthcare providers, nurse practitioners, um, health coaches, everyone who picks up non-toxic will have that opportunity to learn and to share with those around them at a very reasonable level. And I think that's what the textbook is not able to do with the, with the general public, but was meant for doctors who needed that extra dive, deep dive into the science. The non-toxic is meant for people, anyone, to really share this information widely in schools, amongst principals and teachers, everywhere. So hopefully we'll get around that issue, uh, Jerry, and, and try to get this into the hands of the consumer to really learn about it. All right. Well, thank you both. That was a great discussion of, of your book, and I hope everybody will get a copy of it. Now we'll turn to some questions that were asked uh, by the attendees. And the first question has to do with water purification systems. Um, what, can you, is, what can you do in your, in your home? I know there are reverse osmosis systems that you can put in your whole house that maybe are too expensive, but are, are there any kind of point of source or something you can use in the kitchen? People are really interested, especially in lead these days. So is there anything really good for lead? So actually in my house, I have uh, individual units under uh, the sink that are small and much less expensive and less complicated to use than the whole house systems. And uh, they're more efficient also. And they, uh, the one I have uh, that's reverse osmosis also has an inline carbon filtration uh, trap. And um, so these comb this combination of carbon that's going to uh, absorb or adsorb onto the carbon, uh, lipophilic and other compounds, and the reverse osmosis that will get rid of other uh, metals and, and things like that can give you a, a much different level of purity of your water. Nothing is 100% but you can get pretty close with this combination. And I'll, I'll make one more addition to that because we have, a, I have a reverse osmosis in my office here in my office and at home because they are about 250 to 300 dollars 
Um, very cost, re reasonable cost, about $131.50 for a plumber to put it in in one hour, no longer, and about $40 a year more or less, depending on how much you use it to change out the cartridges. Um, and I think that that system is much more cost effective than say buying bottled water, which contributes to Earth's plastics um, and avoids the plasticizing chemicals in our bodies. Um, and so I think it's a good way to go. Um, and, and like I said, I, I, I think that you have to know, be, be well, well versed and vetted on where to get them. And we help you with that through the chapter on drinking water in the book. All right. There's a question of, do you have any idea how many of these synthetic chemicals are in a person? Well, the Centers for Disease Control uh, reports on a few hundred of the thousands and thousands of chemicals out there. Uh, and uh, there have been, uh, Jay and other organizations have looked at, uh, and Commonweal uh, has looked uh, at uh, individuals and profiled that there are hundreds of chemicals that uh, you can assay in people. And the assumption is there are many, many more. So uh, the number of chemicals that are really widely uh, being exposed to is uh, uh, really daunting at the moment. And as uh, Dr. Cohen said, the current Toxic Substance Act, TOSCA, that was revised a few years ago was primarily written by industry for industry, not for public health. Okay, thank you. So this question relates to what are the author's thoughts on lifestyle recommendation as it relates to our population that have limited access in low resource communities. They don't have access to good grocery stores and fresh fruits as easily. So what can they do at least to get started to have a, a lower exposure to chemicals and better nutrition? I'll, I'll field that. So I would say, first of all, thinking about water and creating that kind of system where you don't have to bring bottled water home. I mean, we have lead here in, in Newark, New Jersey. I mean, it, it's a pervasive issue of many of these contaminants. So I think understanding how to get a hold, I would love to see people get grants to be able to get RO filters in their homes. Uh, I don't know if that exists, but I think it's worth exploring. But when it comes to food, you know, frozen organics, for instance, are, are much cheaper than fresh organic foods and perhaps have even more nutrient quality because they're flash frozen at the point of picking. Whereas many um, organic fresh foods, so to speak, have traveled for a while or they've been frozen to a certain degree to tee them up. Uh, to go into the supermarket so we don't always know the quality uh, or the nutrient value of fresh organics, believe it or not. So they're variable. So I recommend in terms of cost trying to find in big box supermarkets flash frozen or just frozen organic produce, fruits, vegetables, and a lot of them are doing that now, big national chains. Um, you know, I think that's one way. The other thing is that people can wash off conventional or non-organic produce with one part vinegar, white vinegar, which is easily bought at a, at a big store, uh, to three parts warm, clean water. So you can actually remove residues, pesticide residues on food on your own. And that's quite efficient. And, um, you know, so I recommend that. And also there's the EWG, a Dirty Dozen Clean 15 list, which we have in our book, which talks about um, which are nationally when they do the yearly testing, um, which uh, fruits and vegetables tend to have the highest levels of pesticide residues on the surface of their skins versus those that are considered the clean 15, which are 15 of the produce that they found had the least um, amount of res pesticide residues. And using that as a guide can really help people discern between what to buy in a supermarket perhaps and not if they're not um, in an environment with organic food. Um, and also choosing seasonally, choosing fruits and vegetables seasonally um, where it may be organic uh, can also lower the cost dramatically. So thinking about that as well um, often can lower the costs um, for people who may have few, less access and, and, and less funding to be able to afford these, um, the healthier and, food, so to speak. 
let me add one thing. Uh, the labeling of foods as organic and, uh, you know, what are all the different labels and what do they mean? Uh, we cover that in the book because it, people are very confused by what the different labels mean. And so there's, uh, we spend some time explaining that. Terrific. So uh, I think this is probably for you, Fred, the, talking about the most sensitive stages and you did mention menopausal women. Do you know anything about environmental endocrine disruptors that have effects at, on menopausal women? Well, there are a whole bunch of chemicals. There were the first ones that we stumbled across 30 years ago that uh, disrupt uh, estrogen and uh, the hormonal systems that are changing during menopause. And one of the things that we have in the environment is a very complicated mix of chemicals like BPA that have a combined stimulating estrogenic effect in some tissues and blocking estrogen effect in other tissues. There's a drug tamoxifen that acts like this. So it's not an unusual thing to find. But uh, nobody, to my knowledge, has really had a focus on menopause and how that transition can be disrupted by chemicals that are influencing the endocrine system, uh, the estrogen system in particular, that's changing during this time. And interesting, I just had to present some work on endocrine disruption and bone loss for osteoporosis community. Um, we know that, and I'm a rheumatologist, so I manage osteoporosis quite regularly, but we know that inflammatory markers like IL-6 and some of the NTNF, they, they actually can lead to disruption of bone metabolism in terms of breaking down or, or lowering the bone, the cells, osteoblasts that build bone up and blocking osteoclast activity. So, you know, this inflammatory condition where, you know, we're getting heart disease and autoimmune disease. Also, we have to think at the cellular level at bone development and metabolism as well. All right. All right. So th this question says uh, that this person heard that fresh organic fruits and other things like that are, are often sprayed with fungicides and paraffin before they get to markets. Do you know about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I really don't know specifics. I think, you know, when you have an unregulated farming system, we really don't know who's doing what or where. Um, you know, paraffin is like a wax. We know, uh, you know, a lot of people put, I, I don't know, I wouldn't say a lot. I just know that it's been done in terms of trying to keep fruits and vegetable skins um, cleaner uh, or with less marks. But I really don't know the answer to that in terms of how pervasive that activity is. Um, but again, cleaning off your fruit, no matter what, or produce, well, no matter what it may have been exposed to is really the goal. Um, and so even if you're getting organic fruits and vegetables, I encourage people to even use the vinegar water or baking soda type of wash because you have oils, you have um, E. coli and other things that are not endocrine disruptors but are not good for us as well. But uh, the Environmental Working Group, uh, ewg.org, is a really good place to go to get that type of information. I would recommend uh, looking through the lists that they have of uh, different types of fruits and vegetables and what are recommended. And for instance, uh, one of the things they point out is strawberries. Yeah, you can find 25 different pesticides. So, you know, you uh, uh, can keep an updated, they do this annually. So uh, list of what are the recommended uh, lower uh -huh. level of pesticide products and what are the ones that you should really avoid. Okay, thank you all very much. We come exactly to 45 minutes and we pretty well answered all of the questions. I think it was a great discussion. I'll turn it back now to Hannah. Great, thank you so much, Jerry and our speakers. Thank you too.
Um, we're approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording will be available on Shay's website soon, and tomorrow you will receive an email containing a link to the video. The next Shea Partnership webinar will take place October 29th and is the first in our newest series titled Generation Chemical, How Environmental Exposures Are Affecting Reproductive Health and Development. The first webinar will feature Drs. Tracy Woodruff, Shana Swan, Jermaine Buck-Lewis, and Jesse Buckley. You can find details on our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events or more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on, your, on our website at healthandenvironment.org. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE Partnerships webinars bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank our speakers, Dr. Ailey Cohen and Dr. Fred Von Saal for taking time to present today. And to you, Jerry, for your excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us. Wishing all of you much health and wellness. Have a great day.